Hey there, once again, YouTube. How you? First off, I just want to let you know my son Lucas, my third kid, is going to be born in about five days. It's gonna he's gonna be born on Sunday, so we're really looking forward to that. Really looking forward to welcoming and welcoming him into this world. And yeah, it's in about five days from right now, and right now, 6:31 p.m. Pacific time, October 29th, 2019. Now, my fiance and I have set up a baby registry for anyone who wants to help out, or you know, pitch in a few bucks or whatever for any little teeny tiny thing. So, if you guys want to come check out my baby registry for my kid that is coming, I will leave a link to it in the description box below under links. So, if you want to help, go ahead. If not, that's totally cool. Just want to let you guys know about that. Also, don't forget I'm still updating things on my website, kind of streamlining some of the parts on my website, and I still got a lot of good resources on here, including stuff about Hawaii Spasmodic Tremor, which I now I update about. Uh, once per month in the Hawaii blog and we have seen a few spasmodic tremor events in Hawaii over the past month of October um, But not too many it's spasmodic tremor seems to have calmed significantly since it was first spotted after the 2018 eruptions, which was uh, let's see the first spasmodic tremor since the eruptions was on January 23rd 2019 and I got a bunch of other different stuff on here. Keep an eye on my Seismo blog. Sometimes I update stuff on there. Again, check out my website if you want. Link is in the description box below, of course. And let's move on. Here we are at volcanoes.usgs.gov on the monitoring page right here. Volcanoes.usgs.gov. And I go over here. Let's see if we can find Steamboat Geyser, the temperature gauge. Now, past 30 days, you can see subsequent uh, minor eruptions leading up to steam. Now, remember, Steamboat Geyser is the largest active geyser on the entire planet, and it can spew a lot of hot water to some very impressive heights. Um, these are all minor eruptions, temperatures from minor eruptions leading up to a steamboat eruption. Then, boom, we see a steamboat eruption, and it goes back down to pre-eruption levels, and then minor eruptions and activity starts to increase, and boom. Typically, the precursors to each major steamboat eruption, which occurs about once per week, um, usually they last about two to three days. Sometimes they can reach almost four days, and other times they're really short and be only about two days worth. As you can see right over here, this is the time period right now, right at the end. We are almost going to see a steamboat eruption, I'm guessing tonight. So it could, it still could erupt by the time I get this video up. But I'm looking for a steamboat eruption somewhere probably early, early tomorrow morning, like 2, 3 in the morning, I would not be surprised. Or this could last for another day, that's very possible. But the precursors have been going on for the past day or two, so it definitely is about to erupt once more. And Steamboat Geyser, again, 2019 is the most active year on record for Steamboat Geyser. And June 2019 was the most active month on record for Steamboat Geyser. So something has definitely changed within the hydrothermal system up there in the Norris Geyser Basin at Yellowstone Caldera. And past seven days, again, you can see precursor activity is occurring as minor eruptions build and build and build and continue to build until we see a major eruption, which likely will occur tonight, which I believe will be the 42nd eruption in 2019, which is quite impressive. Um, let me know how many you think are going to occur in 2019 total. We, it's still not even November yet. So I'm, I'm guessing we're going to see a total of 50 eruptions in one year for Steamboat Geyser, which is very, very impressive, guys. Very, very impressive. Now, moving on. There has been some somewhat interesting activity in the world recently, but let's talk about the one that was somewhat recent. Uh, sorry, this is going a little slow for my computer. We've actually had a few quakes off in uh, near New York, actually, and up in Maine, which is quite surprising. Just a few, not too many. Um, but I wasn't going to focus on that right now. We're going to go over here to the Philippines. Whoops. Come on, there we go. We had a magnitude 6.6 .6 at 15.3 kilometers in depth. And the Digifilo reports seem to indicate some very strong shaking. Not extreme shaking, but very, very strong. Let's look at the epicenter of this event. I do see many aftershocks in this region right here, um, which has to do with the magnitude 6.6. .6, and it does look like we did have a foreshock which occurred, I'm going to say about a week prior, might not be exactly a four shock. I'm thinking it is, though. I'm thinking this 4.4 about a week prior near the epicenter of the 6.6 .6 was a four shock leading up to this major event. Isn't too crazy of an earthquake, but definitely caused a good amount of damage, especially here in the Philippines. Happened near Buell. Just, please let me know if I'm not saying that correctly. 
So again, it is 6.6, 15.3 kilometers in depth, pretty shallow. Let's check out the event page for this earthquake itself. Let's see here, guys. Give it just a second to load. Now, 161 people reported feeling this. Now, thousands, everybody in the Philippines probably felt this earthquake. This is only the number of people who reported feeling it to USGS, and I doubt many people in the Philippines report to USGS. And here's the moment tensor right here, looking primarily like a strike-slip earthquake. I, I believe that moment tensor is indicating a strike-slip event. Now, there were no economic losses or fatalities, thank God. There was barely any landslide action at all, but we did see a significant area affected by liquefaction, which sadly could affect some people, but nobody died, at least I believe. If I'm wrong about that, please let me know. Let's take a very quick look at this from the closest seismic station, which is only a few miles from here, from the epicenter of this 6.6. Here we have some raw seismic data obtained directly from Seismic Station DAV in the IU network, 10 location code, broadband vertical. Since it's a broadband channel, I like to add a 1 hertz high pass filter to get rid of those pesky background microseisms. Um, it's very interesting, guys. This station is pretty close to the epicenter. A lot of times when earthquakes occur in other countries like the Philippines or Indonesia, it's hard to find a good seismic station in the area that is available for data retrieval. But we were able to find one, thank God, and look at how strong, this only goes up to 20 hertz, but still gives us a good look at what is going on. I don't know what was going on here prior to this. Some type of possible tremor or something in the Philippines, which wouldn't be surprising because the Philippines sees volcanic activity all the time. It could be tectonic tremor leading up to this event. I'm not sure, but in my opinion, this looks more like volcanic tremor, but I'm not saying it is. Not saying it is for sure because I haven't looked at the other nearby stations. I just want to let you guys know that we did see some type of strange tremor. Um, and here's the magnitude 6.6. .6. Can barely see it. Let's turn down that color, shall we? Which the color range is power in dB. Decibels. And there we go. We turned it down a little bit. Very, very strong magnitude 6.6, .6, guys. Very, very strong. Going forward, we saw multiple aftershocks, guys. Look at all those aftershocks. Every spike you see is another aftershock. Not every single spike, but most of the spikes, guys. Most of them. Yeah, and then I believe this was the 5.3 aftershock right here. And as we go forward in the day, let's go forward a little bit. You see more aftershocks, more aftershocks, more, more aftershocks. Still seeing that strange tremor-like event right here. Very, very strange, guys. Uh, definitely is not oceanic microseisms, which carry a much lower frequency, so it could be something volcanic. I'm not sh for sure, though, because the Mayan volcano in Philippines is pretty active right now. Usually is. And as of the most recent data, we do see, as of 6, I'm going to say that's about 6.38 p.m. Pacific time, October 29, 2019, we do see another aftershock coming in, likely around the magnitude 4.8. 4.6 to 4.8. Actually, I think it was just reported. Let's go back. Let's see, has it been reported yet? Let's see, nope, I don't know, it has not been reported yet. It should be reported soon, hopefully. But that's very interesting, guys. We did see a 6.6 .6 there. Now let's take a look at the teleseismic signature of this magnitude 6.6 .6 from a station on the west coast of the United States. Remember, teleseismic is simply the recording on a seismograph of a large distant earthquake more than a thousand kilometers away. Here we have seismic station NLWA, the data from this station, and this station resides right on the southern section of the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. Now, since we're looking for the teleseismic signature, excuse me, of a magnitude 6.6 .6 that occurred thousands of kilometers away, we are not going to do a frequency filter on this station at all, okay guys? And we do see the teleseismic signature right here, it comes in at about... Let's see here, 130 UTC or so. And there it is right there. Now let's filter it out just real quick, just to see if there are any higher frequencies that do come in at all in this location. Let's see. Nope, not really, except this little tiny blip right here. This is, uh, I don't know, actually that might not be it. So basically we only saw the low end of the surface waves from this event. Because surface waves always have a much lower frequency than the main body waves or the P wave, obviously. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Saw it on many seismic stations around the planet. Probably every single station on the planet detected this earthquake. Just like 
Usually, earthquakes above magnitude 6.0 are detected on many seismic stations around the world. But let's move on. All right, so we did see right here a magnitude 1.7 to 26.4 kilometers in depth near Cathcart, Washington, which is right around the epicenter of the earthquake that we saw in July. I don't know if you live in Washington State, but we had a magnitude 4.6 in July. Woke me up out of my bed, thought somebody was shaking my bed, trying to shake me awake. I woke up, the uh, the TV swinging, the backboard of the bed's going dong, 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 dong. And I'm like, whoa, earthquake is pretty fun to experience, definitely. And a 4.6 is fun because there's no damage, no one's going to get hurt. It kind of gets the blood pumping, but I don't know. I might be the only one that enjoys earthquakes, at least moderate earthquakes. I don't know if I'd enjoy a huge one, but... Down here, to my surprise, we do see an earthquake swarm that broke out in the past 24 hours at Mount Rainier Stratovolcano. I'm sure everybody knows about Mount Rainier out there, guys. Oh, yeah. So, Mount Rainier saw 11 earthquakes. Nothing too crazy. The largest was a magnitude 2.1 directly under the summit of the volcano right there. 0.9 kilometers in depth, remember? 0 kilometers would be sea level. So that's 0.9 kilometers below sea level. So kind of a little bit deeper than what we usually see right under the cone of the volcano, but, you know, nothing too crazy. I think the second largest event of the swarm was magnitude 1.5. But, yeah, nothing too crazy, guys. But still, just a heads up, we did see some slight swarming at Mount Rainier, which has been very, 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 very quiet lately. I mean, I don't think it's seen a swarm since 2014, I think it was. It's been many, many years since we've seen any type of earthquake swarm in Mount Rainier. But still, let's check out some of these events on the Seismic Program Swarm from a close seismic station. Now here is Seismic Station RCS right on the slopes of Mount Rainier, so right near the, all the action that occurred in the past 24 hours there. Not everything that you see here is an earthquake. Heads up, we do have a calibration pulse. Obviously, that's an electronic signal, which is used to calibrate the machine, and they do that every day or two or something like that. Next, we have obviously the magnitude 2.1 right here, which was pretty strong. And again, this seismic station only detects amplitudes up to 2,000 amplitude count. And it is cut off right off the top. Um, so this is the magnitude 2.1 right here. Has a very strange tail that started right when this earthquake occurred. I've seen that before in Mount Rainier. Some strange higher frequencies associated with that. It does not show on surrounding stations, so that could be an electronic issue when the earthquake came in on the monitor. I have no clue what that could be. But again, we have the calibration pulse, then we have this, and we also have some wind, which is showing up on all frequency ranges. Notice how it's not just very specifically like the lower frequencies or the higher frequencies, but it's showing up on all the frequencies. Notice that. Increase over down here, you can see more of the blue, which is weaker. And up here, you can see more of the light blue which is a little bit stronger all throughout all of the frequency ranges so that is definitely wind what we do see up there because guys it gets pretty dang windy up there um and other things we also have probably some uh or excuse me some small landslides or possible avalanches right there which we do see every, from time to time um some electronic malfunctions let's see if we can find any low frequency events kind of like a ice quake i'm looking for a glacier quake Looking for a glacier quake, but I'm not seeing one. Ah, uh, no, this could be... Oh, that's got lower frequencies associated to it, but it's emergent. So this looks like it could be a glacier quake right here. Let's see. That looks more like a glacier quake as well, or possibly an avalanche or something. We did have some kind of strange lower frequencies in some of these quakes, but I'm having a trouble finding them. Here, look, I think it's this one. Was it this one? Yeah, it was this one. This one has a very sharp P wave arrival, and there's a clear S wave arrival. And it has some dominant lower frequencies. So it's a very strange event. I'm not sure if that's a glacier quake or not, because I don't think glacier quakes have clear P and S wave arrivals like that. Uh, but moving on again, this is magnitude 2.1, which struck Mount Rainier. And throughout the day, we did see some other earthquakes, such as right here. And we did have another one. Let's see, where's the other one? I just saw it. Oh, here's the other one right here. And we did have a few more throughout the day. Here, let's go down. Oh, my goodness. Sorry, guys. Bear with me. All right. And let's see. I think the, Nope. Uh -uh. This is an avalanche or a glacier quake. Too emergent. Far too emergent to be an earthquake. Uh, this is very strange right here. Look at this. Those are some definite lower frequencies. Could be a glacier quake, but I'm not too sure about that. That one's kind of up in the air. Uh, let's see. We did have a few more quakes, but I'm trying to find them. Trying to find them. Because they reported like 12 in the past 24 hours. Uh, let's see. I think they were all up here, actually. Here, let, let me go back up. 
I think a lot of them. Let's see. Let's see what the reported times were for this. From 8.57 UTC to about 13 UTC with a couple afterwards. Okay. So that's why. It's from 08, right? To 13. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Trying to pick them out just by looking. This could be one right here. Yeah, it doesn't look like one right there. Got one right there, that's for sure. Oh, looks like we have another one right there, possibly, with some lower frequencies right there, somewhat. That was kind of a strange quake. So yeah, we did see an earthquake swarm at Mount Rainier, guys. What do you think about it? Let me know in the comments section below. Keep an eye out for more earthquake swarms at Mount Rainier. And let's move on. Here we are at pnsn.org slash tremor, and we are seeing a little bit more ETS, which is episodic tremor and slip occurring down in southern Oregon. ETS over the, now remember ETS happens when the Juan de Fuca plate starts to submerge below the North American plate even more than it usually does. Sometimes it slips, sometimes it sticks, but when it slips, usually there is some noticeable, um, geodetic component as, as in, on, uh, these, GPS instruments, you can see how the ground is shifting over a long period of time. And with seismometers, you can see how the ground is moving, ground motion, over a short period of time. And usually there is slip, which is shown on the GPS stations, which is how the ground is, moves over a long period of time. And on these seismic stations, you can see tremor. Now, ETS, episodic tremor and slip, usually occurs every, what was it, 14 months, I believe, for Washington State. And we had ours early this year. Early this year, we did see a spike in ETS, which basically was our ETS event. But then we saw another spike right here around July, but it was small, well, not that many. And then we, um, the professionals thought in September we were going to see it again. It didn't happen. And it was bouncing all over the place. It wasn't just Washington. It was like the entire Cascadia subduction zone. Here, let me see if I can highlight everything since our ETS began in March. Very sporadic, guys. Very even the professionals admitted on the news that they thought it was very strange. Doesn't mean anything anything bad's coming, guys. It doesn't mean that. But it just means that it is different from the norm. Definitely something they haven't seen. And look at this. The entire Cascadia subduction zone, guys. Look at that. Since March. The entire Cascadia subduction zone. And it wasn't because usually it's bunched up up here in some months and then maybe we get a little bit down here a little bit down here but this is the entire csz cascadia subduction zone since march guys and it's been slipping and sticking and slipping and sticking it's just acting weird it's just going bonkers basically so over the past week or so we did see a magnitude 5.3 off the coast of oregon which may or may not be related to the cascadia subduction zone but i just want to let you know we did see on the 29th a 2.3 at 27.3 kilometers in depth, which definitely is occurring with within the subducted slab. I mean, right where it's starting to dip down, right in that location, maybe a little bit deeper. So this could be related to the ongoing subduction process, and this earthquake could be related to it as well, which was a 2.4 at 29.7 kilometers in depth, right down here. And then we saw another one just southeast of Salem, which was a 1.5, but that was very shallow, negative 0.6 kilometers in depth. Could be an explosion or something like that. And then we did see, over the past week or so, a couple quakes occur on the southern Whidbey Island Fault Zone, which uh, goes straight under uh, the Strait of Juan de Fuca right up here. Goes all the way down, cuts through uh, Mukilteo, Linwood, cuts through Bothell, Woodenville, Duval, if you know where those places are. If you live in Bothell, Woodenville, Duval, you're sitting on top of the largest and most dangerous fault in the state. Yes, it is. I mean, I believe a magnitude 7.5, which is what it's capable of, this entire fault from here all the way down here, about 90 miles long. I believe that the 7.5 would be worse for us who live around here than a 9.0 on the Cascadia subduction zone. A 9.0 in the Cascadia subduction zone would be devastating and just, it'd just be unimaginable for the coast right over here. But the Southern Woodby Island Fault Zone for us, which is capable of a 7.5, way worse. I mean, imagine 10 times as worse as the Nisqually Quake. 
I mean, it, it could be pretty bad. But it th there's no sign of that happening right now. I mean, the 4.6 that occurred in July occurred on the Southern Woodby Island Fault Zone. Just right on the northeastern section of it, though. Just right on the edge. And ever since then, I've been seeing very teeny tiny, very minute, obviously not able to be felt, earthquakes occurring along the Southern Woodby Island Fault Zone. So it's possible that the Woodby Island Fault could be starting to move, but that could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. And most of the time when a fault starts to move after it's been silent for a long time, usually that's bad. Kind of like the Garlock Fault down in California, the 7.1 triggered it and, and it's starting to move now. Not saying anything bad's coming right now, guys, but eventually something, the, the stress will build if a fault starts moving a lot. So not saying that's happening here right now for sure, but I just want to let you know that there have been some extra quakes popping off in this region along this linear trend from southeast to northwest, which follows basically the trend of the Southern Whidbey Island Fault Zone. Now over here again, we see the magnitude 5.3, which occurred off the coast of Oregon, supposedly at 10 kilometers in depth, and then we saw just to the northeast, a very shallow 3.6, at 1.5 kilometers in depth. Surprisingly, someone on the coast of Southern Oregon or Northern Cali did feel this 3.6, which is very surprising. But this 5.2, I thought it was a 5.3, excuse me, it's a 5.2, was felt by multiple people. And as you saw by the location, it's really not occurring on the Cascadia subduction zone, or excuse me, underneath it, or on the Blanco fracture zone. It's occurring kind of in that middle part where there's really, in my opinion, really no reason for that earthquake to have happened. 16 people reported feeling this event, and apparently it successfully sent out a shake alert to people's phones in Northern California and Southern Oregon. So if you got this alert for the 5.2, let me know. Remember to sign up for the Shake Alert app. It is best if you're carrying your cell phone on you and a magnitude nine strikes off our coast, could give you anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute of warning time, depending on where you are and definitely could save your life. That is very, very possible, especially since we are now entering the warning time frame of a Cascadia magnitude 9. Remember, it ruptures every 300 to 500 years, and it's been 319 years. So we're not overdue, but we're definitely in that time frame where it could happen at any time. And nobody knows when that could happen until it happens. So, moving on. Here we are at isthisthingon.org slash Yellowstone, a map made by some cool person. Not me, it was somebody else. <laughs> um, to show all the seismograph webby quarters for the Yellowstone region. And let's go back a previous day. You, If you were keeping an eye on Yellowstone, you noticed there was some interesting seismicity, guys, a few days ago. Um, let's see. On the 27th through the 28th, we saw, I think the largest was a 2.8, I believe. We'll take a look at the reported seismicity in just a second, which it took them days to report some of these earthquakes, surprisingly, which kind of sucks because I kind of wish it was automatically reported like they do in California because they have automatic reporting down there for earthquakes, but... Who knows? Maybe someday, guys. Going back a day earlier, we saw a rapid fire swarm. All of these earthquakes were breaking out near Holmes Hill, closest to station YHH, um, kind of to the northwest of the Norris Geyser Basin. We saw a rapid fire swarm breaking out there. Um, yeah, so let's take a look at this in the seismic program swarm with station YHH. I'm just going to take a quick overview of this earthquake swarm. But first, I just wanted to show the reported seismicity for this earthquake swarm, which spanned about two or three days or so. I'm not going to make an analysis page on it on my website, but you can always download the data from Iris and download the seismic program swarm and look at it yourself if you really wish. And if you don't know how to do that, all my pages on my under the how-to menu on my website can help you do that pretty easy to do to uh, analyze and study and just just keep an eye on volcanoes all throughout the United States all by yourself well, it takes about a week or two to get hang of a hang of it but uh, guys it it's so much easier than just relying on other people I mean really just rely on your own interpretations and learn and grow and that is the best way to do it now right over here we have the Norris geyser basin steamboat geyser is right about here um here we have Madison River down here and of course the Yellowstone Lake all the way down to the southeast um, but for this earthquake swarm, we saw about 87, actually, let me zoom in, get a little more accurate count, about 85 reported events, guys, concentrated near Holmes Hill in that general location near Seismic Station YHH. 
Um, let's see here. Let me click largest magnitude first. The largest was a magnitude 2.6 at 4.8 kilometers in depth. Now, I know none of these have felt reports. If this was in a highly populated area, I bet somebody would have reported feeling it. But since there aren't that many people, there aren't that many visitors there this time of year, and how it's very remote area, it's doubtful that many people are going to feel the event. I mean, whenever people would say, oh, nobody felt that earthquake in Yellowstone, who cares about it? That really doesn't matter because there aren't that many people in Yellowstone to begin with. But I mean, this swarm is not concerning at all. Definitely. You really need to see a swarm for a good few days with magnitude threes and magnitude fours to be worried about anything. But still, we're going to take a look at it in the seismic program swarm. And you should always monitor these areas, regardless of what I say or what anybody else says on YouTube. All right, here we have seismic data obtained from station YHH in the WY network at Yellowstone, which is the closest seismic station to this event. The only thing I could find all the way prior was this little teeny tiny four shock likely associated with the coming swarm within the hours of this event. At 841 UTC on October 26, 2019, it was the tiniest little guy, but it did occur. Nevertheless, clear PNS wave arrivals on that. We see the swarm started officially around 1425 UTC on October 26, 2019. Included some very, very small earthquakes as the time went on. Notice very, very small guys. This one was kind of emergent. I don't know what the heck that was right there. But it looks like there's a PNS wave arrival, but I don't know. That could have been two earthquakes occurring at one time, though. Sometimes that does happen. And then we did see another tiny event, probably 0 0.8 to 1.5 the quakes here and there but the ball didn't really get get rolling uh fully until let's keep going forward teeny tiny 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 events and then boom right at about 1549 or so we did see the swarm that's when it started to break out for sure and i believe this was the largest event i believe i'm not too sure about that actually it could have been the next day that we saw the largest event of the swarm but we saw many events, guys. I'm talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of quakes in a short period of time. Remember, they only report those that they are able to accurately locate. Most swarms only see, I'm going to say, probably 20 to 30% of the events reported. Sometimes I agree with that number, and sometimes I don't. It just all depends on the characteristics of the events in question. Now, keep going forward. We see a lot of earthquakes occurring as part of the swarm. Let's zoom out. See, you can tell they're all occurring in rapid succession. Kind of like what we see around West Thumb Lake at Yellowstone from time to time, which actually West Thumb Lake has not seen a good rapid fire swarm in a long time. Let me bite my tongue because you never know that could break out tonight. That happens sometimes. Continued swarming around 1836 on the 26th. Um, more rapid fire swarming, which uh, shows that something was trying to pass through the ground. Usually that's what it means. Usually. Now, if there is a large earthquake and there are aftershocks occurring in rapid sequence, that's from the fault shifting after the large earthquake. But when you see kind of with no main shock in an earthquake swarm, and it's kind of in, in, it kind of goes off and on, and it's they're all in rapid fire characteristics or rapid fire succession, excuse me. Um, that usually means that something's flowing through the ground, like magmatic fluids or something like that. That's usually been in the case, and plus Yellowstone has such a huge hydrothermal system, we should see fluid migration occur at probably every month or so. I mean, I, I'd be surprised if we didn't. Moving forward, we see more earthquakes, more earthquakes. Okay, now it's starting to get a little boring. Let's move forward, though. Then we see a few more earthquakes down here. Starts to pop off even more after a few hours of silence. Gets a little bit more interesting. Now, I thought this was a part of this earthquake. It's not. Those are two earthquakes very close together, guys, within just a few seconds of each other, right there. Going forward is when we saw the largest magnitudes, I believe. Let's see here. No, or is it this one? No, I believe this was the 2.6. 2.6 or 2.5. Correct me if I'm wrong. Right there. And so, yeah, we did see some swarming at Yellowstone, guys. It's been a while. Yellowstone has been pretty boring lately, guys. That's why I've been kind of focusing on other things lately. Pretty boring. Uh, yeah. But now it's not. And we did see a couple of breaks right there, but yeah, not much. And as of the most recent data stream down here, as of 7.10, or I'm going to say about 7.05 p.m. Pacific Time, October 29th, 2019, nothing. Pretty calm right now at, at the, uh, the infamous supervolcano. Or should I call it Caldera? Some people don't like the word supervolcano. Some people don't like the word caldera. Well, it's a caldera, so that's what I'm going to call it. 
Hope you guys have a great day. Again, if you want to check out the baby registry that I created, go ahead and check that out. I'll leave a link to it in the description box below. I hope you all have a great day. God bless. And if anything crazy happens, I'll see you later. Remember to check back on my website if you see Steamboat Erupt. I usually try to update my plots on my Steamboat Geyser 2019 page pretty quickly. Remember, you just go to my website here. Just go to my website, which is in the description box below. Go to seismic, or excuse me, go to Yellowstone, go to Steamboat Geyser Eruptions, quick Steamboat Geyser, or excuse me, Steamboat Eruptions 2019. And that's pretty much it for now, guys. Hope you have a great day. God bless, and Steamboat should erupt tonight. Woohoo!